Tech Time Traveler here, and today I have a really, really rare piece of vintage terminal history. This is the Lear Sigler ADM1 terminal. If you're a serious vintage computer nerd like I am, you're probably already quite familiar with Lear Sigler. These are the guys that made the iconic ADM3A, a terminal that is legendary for its elegant, compact design. These terminals are highly sought after and routinely go for hundreds of dollars at auction. The ADM3A has made appearances all over the place, everything from TV to video games. But all great stories start somewhere, and the ADM story starts with this terminal, the ADM-1. But before we get into that, some background. John G. Brooks, the founder of Siegler Corporation, was a visionary who was bent on building a conglomerate with many different product lines, similar to companies like General Electric. He and some fellow investors had purchased what was called the Siegler Heating Company in 1954, using a 24-hour loan for $3.2 million. Over the next several years, Brooks pursued a strategy termed buying growth, by buying up existing businesses and applying sound management to fuel expansion. Brooks's conquest would eventually cause him to cross paths with one William Powell Lear, also known as Bill Lear. Yes, that Lear. Lear was a talented engineer and inventor who helped create things like miniature tuning coils for portable radios. He sold his radio coil and wire corporation and purchased a stake in the Galvin Manufacturing Company. Working with Howard Gates of Zenith, the two men created the first radio for automobile use. Lear, along with Galvin founder Paul Galvin, named their radio the Motorola, with Galvin Manufacturing Company eventually being renamed to match. Lear's interest in aviation, begun with the purchase of a biplane in 1931, led him to found Lear Developments, which initially provided radios for aviation use. But Lear wanted to go further and develop his own airplanes. His board, however, disagreed, so Lear sold his interest in what had been renamed Lear Incorporated to Brooks's Siegler, and eventually developed what would be known as the Learjet. Lear Incorporated and Siegler Corporation merged in 1962. The late 1950s and early 60s were boom times for companies involved in aerospace. The launch of Sputnik in 1957 had spooked America, and a crash program to get men on the moon before the decade was out was well underway. Lear Siegler, or LSI for short, used its aeronautics know-how to grow into a diverse company with interests in power equipment, systems, avionics, commercial products, and so on, with sales approaching a billion dollars by 1970. The ADM, or Advanced Dream Machine, was not LSI's first terminal product. There had been earlier computer terminals before it, like the 7700A, but the ADM was a different product. It was designed to be as compact and low cost as possible. LSI pulled the design down to a single PCB, quite a feat given that microprocessors hadn't become available yet, and that required a processor to be implemented using discrete logic. The new terminal was just 21 inches deep, measured 12 inches high and just 16 inches wide, and weighed in at a svelte 45 pounds. The luxurious 12-inch screen allowed for up to 960 characters, 12 lines of 80 characters each, using 64 alphanumeric characters composed on a 5x7 dot matrix. An optional upgrade screen allowed up to 1920 characters that permitted 24 lines rather than 12. The ADM-1 terminal was designed for general purpose use and featured an RS-232 point-to-point -point interface that could handle speeds up to 9600 baud in full or half duplex conversation modes. The terminal provided some editing capability as well, with the ability to clear the screen as well as do what they called a destructive cursor for character change. The terminal was optionally available with insert and delete, as well as line insert and delete. It also featured cursor control and the ability to do reverse image. LSI touted the terminal's field protection system as a major feature, which allowed certain information to be protected and kept on screen while the user carried out editing functions elsewhere. For a keyboard, the ADM-1 featured a 53-key typewriter-style keyboard with the basic letters, numbers, and function keys made by, I think maybe it was Keytronic? It kind of looks like a Keytronic. More on that later. An upgraded model offered 60 keys with keys for cursor control. For those requiring a full number pad, an optional external unit like this one was also available. All of this was available for just $1,500, which was pretty darned affordable as far as terminals went back then. And what a looker. Okay, it's not quite as sleek as what would become the ADM-3 or 3A, but still, what a beauty. And I'm not sure if the fire engine red is an actual LSI option, but it looks pretty hot in that particular shade. In my video about the TV typewriter, I mentioned that Don Lancaster didn't actually invent the glass CRT or video-based computer terminal. And this machine is exactly the sort of thing that would have been on offer when the TVT was coming out. It's just that $1,500 was hardly the kind of money a home user would be prepared to spend. That's around $11,000 in today's money, versus a couple hundred for Lancaster's TVT. Nope, this was strictly a corporate beast, although perhaps it may have seen second-hand use in a home. It sure looks like it spent some time in someone's garden shed. Yeah, this particular ADM-1 looks like it's definitely seen better days. The red paint is chipping off, revealing a blue undercoat. 
Like I said, I'm not really sure if this red is the original LSI supply colored or if somebody decided to customize it a bit. Most of the brochures I've seen advertise a light blue and white combination. The unit is quite deep. 21 inches may have been compact in 1973, but uh, that's as wide as a standard table or counter these days. And wow, is this thing long. And at 45 pounds, yeah, that's heavy enough. That's like one of those big bags of salt to use for a water conditioner. Thankfully, these things didn't get moved around a lot. I do love the keyboard. There is something really cool about these earlier IBM Selectric style keycaps with their more square appearance. With IBM being sort of the gold standard for business equipment, it makes sense that a lot of people were trying to emulate them. This thing types quite nicely and it has great feedback for a half century old keyboard. I'm not really sure if this is the capacitive foam type keyboard that I was thinking it was. If it is, I'll have to go through the whole pad replacement process, which isn't too bad, but isn't trivial either. It looks like this unit was equipped with the optional numeric keypad. This thing is so cute. It looks like the dialer for an old phone or, you know, a homemade nuclear bomb. It's called a little game of chance. I'll bet you that I can turn this key and blow us all to hell even after you shoot me. Speaking of bombs, I'm a bit leery of plugging this baby in. The seller did indicate that it quote unquote powered on, which means it didn't go on fire or anything, and also means that the potential damage to the machine is probably already done, unfortunately. But I'm still a little bit, pardon the pun, leery of plugging it in just yet. The backside of the terminal has one RS-232 connector and controls for baud, brightness, contrast, and so on. Pretty basic stuff back here. Definitely it looks like this machine was stored or used somewhere without good climate control, possibly something industrial. The keys are filthy and the screen clearly has some cataract issues. Cataracting is something you often see on really old CRTs. CRTs had an anti-implosion shield adhered to the CRT front glass, which is actually quite thin. This is to stop it from peppering you with little glass shards if it breaks. Over time, the glue begins to break down and discolor, creating this ugly broken glass effect you see here. It is repairable, but it requires discharging the CRT properly and then very carefully cutting the shield loose and then re-adhering it, all while avoiding breaking the fragile CRT glass. It's not without its risks and I'm not comfortable with discharging CRTs yet, so I'm going to let that slide for today. Also on the back we have the label of the supplier of this machine, the Systems Corporation. This was unit number 19 apparently. I can't find much info on this company. It looks like they did a fair amount of consulting for IT purposes back in the day. It looks like they may have even produced mainframes or something. Anyway, let's pull the cover off here and see what we've got. The cover is in pretty good shape apart from paint chipping, but I can see there's a long crack along the top here. We'll want to repair that to keep it from getting any worse. The cover appears to be made of fiberglass, probably the cheapest way to make a case versus using ABS plastic. Well, no wonder this thing is heavy. Look at all this metal. I don't know what it is about these earlier keyboards. I just love how angular they are. It appears this keyboard was adapted by LSI and may have had other applications given the edge connector over here. We can see a glimpse of the mainboard below. It's mostly underneath this base plate the monitor is attached to. Let's have a look around here before we mess around with that and see if anything scary jumps out. Yeah, I mean everything kind of looks okay. Actually it looks much better than what I was expecting looking at it from the outside. Uh, yeah, whatever was going on on the outside doesn't seem to have filtered in too much inside and Oh, most of the caps and everything look like they're in pretty decent condition, if just a little bit dusty. All right, first things first, let's fix this case up. I'm going to use some Gorilla Glue on the inside here to reinforce the back side of the crack. This stuff is strong as hell and it should help keep the crack from getting any worse. Now let's get this keyboard cleaned up. All right, and now I'll just remove all the keycaps, and yeah, I still don't have a keycap puller, but you know what? These aren't too hard to remove, so I'm going to keep being cheap and doing it the hard way because that's easier than doing it the easy way. Uh, I think. All right. Yeah, wow. It's pretty nasty in here, and that's before we get to the spiders. Okay, now that the keycaps are off, I can remove the keyboard from its metal base plate. There's just about six bolts here that I have to remove to get the keyboard off this mounting plate. And yeah, that's uh, pretty dirty, but not too, too bad. Let's lift her off here. Wow, those are big key switches. The keyboard PCB looks to be in decent condition underneath. Nothing really broken or tarnished too badly. The production date code is kind of hard to read, but it looks like 1973 or 1974. Early 70s gear is really special to me, 
It's just because it's before the microprocessor really caught fire and changed everything. This is kind of like looking at a lost world. You don't see a lot of equipment from prior to 1975 or so on the market these days. Most of it is long since disposed of. Yeah, I'm gonna try using an old toothbrush here and uh, some alcohol and just try to brush out the dust between the key switches. Yeah, that looks a bit better. For cleaning the keycaps, I just use a damp microfiber cloth. Still hate how these feel on my hands, but boy do they clean up things nicely. Man, look at all these nice clean keycaps. Always nice to type on something without having to touch a layer of slime in the process. These things look almost brand new. Now, before I reassemble, I should probably test and see if these key switches are actually working. Yep, these look to be just fine. And also, I was wrong. This is not a Keytronic keyboard. This keyboard was made by a company called Controls Research Corporation, or CRC for short. The key switch isn't the foam pad type often used by Keytronic either, and that's a good thing because those love to degrade over time. It's some kind of reed switch. According to some sources, these keyboards are actually quite rare. I'm glad this one wasn't scrounged by those keyboard guys. Okay, let's lift the monitor off here. Uh, there's just a few screws I have to remove to do that. And the entire monitor and power supply assembly is on this big plate. I just have to disconnect these two connectors at the back here and then kind of, uh, it seems like I gotta slide it backwards. Yeah, I'm just trying to get around the brightness and control knobs. And then we'll lift it off and set it aside. And there it is. That's the motherboard. Wow, look at all that logic. That is one freaking huge board. <laughs> That's way bigger than I was thinking it was going to be. And fans of the TV typewriter know this little guy, a Signetix 2513 character generator. That tells us that this terminal produces the same character set as the TV typewriter, albeit at a much higher resolution and for far more characters. Very cool. And that means that like the TVT, this machine can only produce uppercase alphabet character. So this is kind of like the TVT's big brother. Okay, let's just uh, take a little tour here. So this is obviously our RAM, this is our character generator. Um, I'm gonna guess this is the UART up here. Not really sure what that is. Wow, that's still a fair number of chips, but it's not really dramatically more than this Hazeltine 1500 board, which had the benefit of having a microprocessor to help bring the overall countdown. I feel like the spacing here is probably a bit more than necessary. In the ADM3, LSI shrunk things down a bit and made room for a high-tech keyboard on the same PCB. Everything on this board seems to be organized by function. I'm guessing that's what these little white boundary lines demarcate. I'll just carefully dust the PCB and look for any signs of burns or shorts. Not really seeing anything though. I really hope there aren't too many problematic chips here because my chances of solving any problems involving something with this many, yeah, pretty dicey. I suppose I shouldn't forget about the external number pad here and give that some attention also. Let's open that up and clean. Much better. Nice and clean. All right, now we'll return to the CRT position here. Yeah, it's too bad I can't do much about that cataracting going on. Man, that looks awful. Uh, looking at the ring around the screen though, I'm not really sure how easy this would be to get apart even if I was inclined. Yeah, it looks like a bit of a risky project. It may be more productive to see if a replacement CRT tube exists. All right, well, let's start putting things back together. Obviously the first thing we need to do is reassemble our keyboard, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that, starting with the space bar, and voila, I've got it backwards. Not a good omen. Okay, let me try and turn this around here, and I just broke it. Man, I can't believe I let that happen. I totally pictured it happening as I was doing it, but uh, yeah, it happened anyway. Okay, well, we'll have to get our Gorilla Glue friend out here and fix the mount that attaches to the spacebar stabilizer bar, and then we'll let that sit overnight. 
Meanwhile, I'll continue with putting the other keys back onto the keyboard. The next day, the spacebar glue seems to have taken effect. All right, and there we go. Yeah, that looks much better. Okay, time to start putting it all back together. But first, I'm gonna do a little bit of a wipe down on the number pad cover here. And then we'll reassemble. Great, and now to reassemble everything. Now getting the monitor plate reinstalled correctly I thought was going to be a bit of a bear because I have to get it rather awkwardly over and through the brightness and control knobs at the back. But actually it didn't prove to be all that difficult. It was just a matter of getting the little side rails on the plate onto the side rails from the base and then sliding it all forward. It seems to lock in at exactly the position I need to align the screw holes properly. So yeah, that was a lot easier than I thought. Thanks LSI. Yeah, now we're done. I'll throw the cover back on here and we'll give it a really good wipe down. The Gorilla Glue seems to be holding things together pretty well. So yeah, I'm not really sure what to do about that paint yet. Talking to some folks over at VC Fed, it seems like these terminals were indeed meant to be that blue color popping out. We don't really know the terminal's full story. Maybe the red was chosen by Systems Corporation or maybe it was spray painted by a later owner. All right, so we've got the cover back on. Wow, this thing looks a lot better. So I guess now we can ask the question, do I or don't I? Like I said, the eBay seller I bought this from did claim to have turned it on once and obviously it didn't go on fire, you know, if they're not lying. Or at least nothing burnt that was visible to my eye. I regret my camera didn't capture my testing of the power supply, but I did do a cursory check and the voltages seemed to be all right. So maybe we're safe to power it up? All right, well, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So we got the fire department on standby and I'm gonna duck like a coward under the table here with my power bar and just flip the switch while you guys on camera get to watch the action. If I hear anything, you know, explodey, I'll immediately shut it off and then look for a fire extinguisher. Woohoo, no fire. And it looks like it's chirping? A single beep at startup. Yeah, no, it's consistently doing that every time I power on and power off. Yeah, it kind of says I'm working. Cool. No video though. Hmm. Maybe the brightness is dialed down. Oh. Okay. There's something going on there. Yeah. Can't really make it out though.
Okay, I'm gonna dial the brightness way back. Gonna leave the contrast. Try right, one more time. Okay, yeah, so we've got a fair amount of junk. It's kind of hard to make out because the uh, cataracts, they're kind of make it difficult. It is reacting though. That's interesting. Oh, there's the cursor way up there. Uh, okay, so it was just a brightness and contrast issue. Nice. Well, that is so cool. I can actually see text on screen and it looks like the characters are properly formed. And yeah, this does appear to be a fully upgraded version of the ADM-1. I'm counting at least 24 lines of text there, which was the max. Taken together with the 60 key keyboard and the numeric keypad, this particular machine probably ran north of $2,000. One weird thing about the text though, it looks like it's in reverse video. Hmm. Well, whatever, that's pretty awesome that I'm getting anything at all. Remember kids, this terminal is older than I am, nearly half a century old. Sadly, I'm not younger by that much. Yeah, this kind of looks like a RAM issue to me. The machine types reliably and the characters often come out with something different, but what's produced is always consistently the same thing. Kind of suggests a stuck bit somewhere. I'm not sure if the reverse video is an accident of whatever is ailing this machine or if it was in fact configured that way. Unfortunately, since the ADM-1 doesn't use sockets, pulling the RAM out to check it means I'm going to have the nightmare of desoldering over 200 pins and then resoldering in some sockets. Ugh. So thinking about this, um, it might be worthwhile to go through some of these control sequences and see if the terminal responds uh, because uh, there's a few here that'll give us a, a clear indicator. One is a control G, uh, clear screen. Um, I don't know if the send is doing anything, but it might give us an indication as to whether the brains of the terminal are still functional. So that might, uh, point to, you know, maybe just having a RAM issue or if there's something more serious going on. So I'm going to light her up here and let's give it a shot. So the most obvious one to go for would be audible tone, which is the equivalent of the bell key. Let's see. And that is control G. Yeah, I'd say that's working. Um, what else have we got here? Clear screen is basically just clear. And just type a bunch of stuff. And clear. Yeah, I mean, it's going to P's, which is not correct, but it is responding to that. <laughs> Let's see what other ones we've got here. Well, obviously we know the cursor keys work for the most part. There's our cursor blinking away. Increment up, down, right, left can be done by the control keys as well. So let's see, let's control K. Yeah, control K goes up, control J goes down. And there is a resetter, kind of like a reboot. Control shift, repeat, clear home break. Control shift, repeat. Yeah, no, that, that would indicate to me that the basic brains and the control panel of this thing are, are functional. So, I mean, that's good. I guess for kicks, we could try hooking this up to another serial device and see what happens. I'll use my trusty ThinkPad 380XD here with Hyper Terminal. I'm not really sure what speed this beast is running at. On the back here, we have two stickers that look like they're identifying the baud rate. One says H4800 and the other says L300. But why two different rates? Okay, so going to the manual here, I can see we indeed do have some internal jumper blocks that set the baud rate. So let's take the lid off and pop the keyboard off again and see what we can see. Yeah, so we have two blocks here and sure enough, they're marked 4800 and 300. No easy dip switches here, folks. This is 1973. 
You gotta roll up your sleeves, get out your soldering iron, and actually solder in some diodes. Wow. But uh, yeah, these diodes appear to be in the correct positions for the marked rates, as per this chart. So this machine either operates at 4800 or 300. Or maybe it sends at one speed and receives at another? I'm not sure. Okay. So we got everything set up here. I'm gonna turn on the terminal and we're gonna see what happens. I'm just gonna type some stuff. There's no reaction whatsoever. And I will try sending stuff back. Okay, so that didn't work. Okay, well, whenever we have a mystery regarding operation, it's always good to turn to our trusty friend, Mr. Breakout Box. Mr. Breakout Box will tell us what, if anything, this terminal is doing. Okay, so we have a couple of lights already here, but I'm not seeing anything on the RX or TX lines. Those send and receive lights should be flashing as I type. Now, it's possible this terminal is expecting things to be wired up a certain way, and maybe there's certain signals it needs before it can actually communicate. Reading the manual, I became aware that this terminal offered a block sending feature. This is very similar to the screen read function that was available on the Southwest Technical Products TV Typewriter 2. I mentioned that in my video about that machine. Basically what this allowed you to do was do some editing locally and then send everything you typed in one block by hitting shift and send. If I've read right, it seems like the terminal, if it's in block mode, won't send anything until shift send is pressed. And if I hit that key combination, it does look like the terminal reacts. First, the cursor seems to freeze up and I can't type. Second, the CTS, or clear to send light, comes on. The only way out of this is to force the terminal to reset. A quick chat with our VC fed chums confirms this terminal has a couple of switches that might be having an effect here. One of them handles duplex modes, offering half, full, and what's called block mode. If the switch is in the block mode position, then that may account for our strange behavior. The problem is, these switches seem to be sliced right off. One looks like it's been welded into place. I can't really tell what position they're in and probably will need to take the terminal apart again to do some continuity testing. And that's where our little mini restoration has to stop, I'm afraid. Before I go tearing the terminal apart again, I wanna make sure I have some new RAM on hand. Then I can see about those switches on the back and with the terminal producing reliable output locally, I can see what I can get remotely. So that's the LSI ADM1, folks. And I do think for its time, it's a pretty impressively featured quote unquote little terminal. I love the classic terminal look, the look and feel of the keyboard and that crazy number pad dangling off the side. I don't know for sure if this terminal was intended to be red, but it looks pretty good sporting that color, don't you think? This unit is a fitting beginning, I think, to a computing success story, at least for the model line itself. As for Lear Siegler, well, their luck wasn't so great. In 1971, during a business dinner in Detroit, John G. Brooks, the company's CEO and founder, suffered a fatal stroke and died at the age of 58, having acquired and merged nearly three dozen businesses into LSI. The loss of its founder hurt the company badly. Further, that same year, LSI found itself in troubled waters when a major project they were involved in, supplying controls for the Lockheed L-1011 TriStar commercial jet, faced major delays due to the near bankruptcy of engine maker Rolls-Royce. Further project delays and strikes at major clients only served to further dent the company's fortunes. Eventually, in 1986, LSI was sold by investment banking firm Drexel Burnham and purchased by Forsman Little. Forsman Little then began breaking up John Brooks's empire piece by piece, selling units to various interested parties and eventually becoming a private company. Despite the difficulties faced by its maker, the ADM series would go on to enjoy a fairly successful career, setting the standard for good quality, low-cost terminals. Following the ADM-1 in 1973, the 1974 LSI released the larger and more capable ADM-2. This in turn was followed by the iconic ADM-3A, a unit that is still prized by collectors today, and it shaved the cost of computer terminals to just below $1,000. The ADM-3A was followed by the ADM-4, and finally the ADM-5. I don't actually have an ADM-3 in my collection. Like I said, they go for hundreds of dollars and they don't come up that often. But in the interim, I'm glad to have this progenitor of the series. I can't wait to fire up Zork or anything my serial-based computers can send it. But for now, that'll have to await parts and some more sweat equity. 
For sure, I will video that process and update as progress happens. Anyway, that's it for this video. And as always, thanks so much for watching.